Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, past, present, future sometimes, um, as solo artists, as group, you name it, we talk about it. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of Talk More Talk. And he now also has his own YouTube channel with more Beatles-related interviews on it. Ken, Beatling all the time. How's it going? It's going well, Alan. That's, that's a verb now, right? Beatling? Beatling. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. That's what, that's what we all major in. That's right. And Darren DeVivo, uh, DJ at WFUV FM 90.7 in the New York area since 1984. Um, and if you're not in the New York area, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. And when we do the sign offs, he'll give you further directions. How's it going, Darren? Uh, you push it, it goes. So <laughs> all is well. Mm -hmm. Sort of like the Mets. Uh, yeah, and, and the, the Yankees, too. But, but. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. You have to press to play. Excuse me? You have to press to play when it comes to Darren. Uh, Paul McCartney right. reference. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> See? Ken is beetling. He's beetling. So play. See? Yeah, yeah. He's, I'm pointing like you are, you're on my left, Ken. I don't know if that's going to be yes. for okay. everyone, but... You know, while you watch this thing. Hmm. Anyway, it's like Hollywood Squares. We're hmm. still figuring out the mysteries of Zoom. Yeah, we don't know what we're doing. Well, today we have a, uh, a, a curious theme that um, Darren came up with, um, which was to identify what for us are the best closing tracks on Beatles and solo albums. Um, closing tracks are important. Uh, you know, the, the, the Beatles always thought about their albums as, uh, you know, in terms of running order. I mean, the first couple were essentially uh, idealized versions of their set list. So you got to start as a strong starter, a strong closer. Um, but, you know, it doesn't always work and it isn't um, necessarily always what they want, you know, to have a strong closer um, as they went on over the years. So we're going to look at, um, at, at various choices of our own of, of which closers work best on Beatles and solo albums. And before that, we got the news. So over to Ken. Okay. Thank you, Alan. I realize that for some of you, this is old news at this point, but it's been a few weeks since our last show. And uh, we do have to discuss the official announcement that was made on August the 26th about the upcoming box set on Let It Be. For the CD box set, we'll be getting five CDs plus a Blu-ray. The first disc is a remix of the album from Giles Martin. The second and third discs are comprised of rehearsals and jams from Apple Studios. The fifth disc is the 1969 Glenn Johns mix for the album. And the next disc is really an EP with four songs. It's two from the Glenn Johns 1970 mix of Across the Universe, and I Mean Mine. Plus, there's two, uh, two new remixes for the single versions of Let It Be and Don't Let Me Down. And the Blu-ray will have a Dolby Atmos mix, a 5.1 mix, and high-resolution stereo of the new mix. The deluxe version comes as a book with an outer slipcase. A five-record vinyl super deluxe edition also will come out as a book and will have exactly the same content as the CD box set with four LPs and one EP, but not the Blu-ray counterpart with surround sound mixes. The book is a 100-page hardcover with an introduction from Paul McCartney and will have extensive notes and track-by-track -track recording information with never-before-seen photos, personal notes, tape box images, and more. Other configurations will also be a two-CD version, which will have the new remix for the album from Giles Martin and a CD outtake highlights 
uh, disc, which will include the Glenn John's 1970 mix for Across the Universe. And there'll also be a single LP and single CD versions of just the Giles Martin remix. And with this announcement, Universal has made available three advanced tracks to preview, which are all on YouTube. The 2021 remix for the single version of the song Let It Be, the first performance on the Apple rooftop for Don't Let Me Down, and from the Glenn Johns mix of For You Blue. The box set is due out October the 15th, and on the same day, the book for Get Back will be released, but it's not the same book as the one that we'll get with Let It Be. Uh, before we comment at all about this, while I don't have all the details, as with so many new archival releases from the Beatles and their solo music, different retailers are offering special goodies to go along with them. Barnes & Noble will have a Let It Be tote bag. Target will have a Let It Be t-shirt, which will only come in one size, and that's large. And Walmart will have four separate photos of the Beatles that they will offer. There's also going to be a picture disc version of the Let It Be album on the Beatles website. That's all the details I have about that. Do you guys want to comment about any of this, any of the variations? Um, I have to see it. Like, you know, it's mm. hard when you're reading off or when you're skimming like a, a list on a press release. I didn't quite understand the concept of including an EP. Um, um, and I'm sure that that's going to be a, a hot topic. At when it comes, when when people actually are like, "Holy smoke!" They really meant to, you, you know, when you have it in your hand. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't totally get um, the EP concept. And also, I'm still holding out hope that the box set's going to be one thing. The book that's been available, well, it's coming on in October, but the one that was announced a long time ago. Uh, was like one thing and then you figured out oh, there'll be a box set boom the box set we've got the movie coming is the movie coming on blu-ray after the fact and what about the original cut of let it be and what about um uh the full rooftop whether audio video or both there's holes here if nothing else comes out beyond the box set i think i'll be personally a little disappointed with the box set as a standalone thing but if the Peter Jackson film follows and comes out on a physical disc. And we get those other things that I just mentioned, take that whole, all of these releases as one and it'll be hard to complain, but looking specifically at the box set now from the press releases, the EP is a head scratcher for me, but uh, uh, you know, it when all is said and done, people watching you folks watching us, you're going to like it. You're going to love it. You might have you might have issues with what could be missing or how it could have been done differently. But still, I mean, it's 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 going to be a gold mine uh, of stuff that coming out legally for the first time. But mm. the EP, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. already a head scratcher for a yeah. lot of fans. And there'll always be fans that'll think you could have put a lot more on this. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm reviewing it for the Wall Street Journal, so I actually have already heard it. And I can tell you the EP makes no sense whatsoever. Um, I have no idea why they did that. I, I can't even think, you know, usually I can figure out someone's rationale. Well, could it be, would you say, Ken, total number of discs in the in the big box set, in the Five it's, or six, did you say? Well, six if you count the Blu-ray. Okay, six right. discs. Now, if you were to take the songs that are on the EP and put them on another disc, which is probably would be the sensible thing to do, put them in with, like, the Glenn Johns mixes just separated, um, now you've, like, reduced your box set by a disc, and it's <laughs> might be... A, a, we might be getting tricked here, because now you, you're skimping on something yeah. that in the mm -hmm. past with each box set, I'm sure people are expecting bigger and more. Right. And uh, by putting out the EP, there's the illusion that you're getting 
No, it's six discs. But it, it, no, it's it especially really doesn't work in a case where every single moment of these sessions has been bootlegged. We know what they had to choose from. So it's not as if, you know, if they had to reduce it by a disc, they had to sit there and say, oh, my God, what can we include? You know, there's mm. plenty to include, um, but it would mean using the Twickenham stuff um, um, because really the Apple stuff, they pretty much had rehearsed the material and they were recording the material that was going to be on the album. And I guess they felt that there's, um, you know, only so many outtakes of the same song that you can have, but there were jams in between some of the songs. I mean, we have all these recordings, um, but they could also have gone back to Twickenham. They may feel that Twickenham, since there wasn't a multi-track console available at Twickenham, um, the reason we've heard them all is because of the Nagras, but the Nagras are mono recordings um, very high quality mono recordings. Um, and they sometimes have, you know, they, they basically are following the film crew. So there are beeps and there are slate calls, but it's not like there's a beep or a slate call every two minutes. There are long stretches of music and with today's technology, I mean, um, it, at least two people I know of have already, used for STEM technology uh, and um, other things to make stereo mixes of some of these, these tracks. So there's a ton of stuff that they could use from Twickenham um, to fill this set out. The thing is that they might not have wanted to because that stuff's in the Peter Jackson film. I mean, we don't know what's in the Peter Jackson film. So this is only theoretical, right? Um, if Peter Jackson has all the stuff like, you know, Susie's Parlor and the fast version to get back and the fast version of two of us and, and a lot of those other things that um, everyone has known and loved since about 1970, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very possible that that's why they're not in here. And that when the film comes out and the Blu-ray, we will then have, a really good selection of stuff from the get back, let it be sessions. Um, but if it were to be just this box, um, I'm not sure you can make that case. Um, so maybe release a soundtrack album. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Yeah. So, you know what I mean? The soundtrack yeah. to Peter Jackson's get back or whatever, you know, uh, and, and there you'd have at least a healthy sampling of, the Nagra tapes, et cetera. Um, you guys familiar with, uh, it's a triple bootleg, the Black Album? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it the Behind Closed Doors, that one? It's, no, it's the, it's, 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 it's the Black Album. It was actually the first bootleg I ever bought mm -hmm. uh, at the first Beatle Fest I ever went to. Mm. And I was learning at this point and still trying to figure, seeing things that now I know are obviously bootleg recordings, but going through the bins back when uh, those who have gone to Beatle Fest before and have gone for many, many, many years, back in the day, the record vendors would have their bootlegs right in there with, you know, uh, with the regular releases. And I remember seeing so much stuff that I was like, what, what is this thing? Yeah. And the black album was the white album in reverse, packaging wise. Right. Uh, but it was, uh, and it came with a poster with Let It Be photos. And I don't recall, I think there was bits of dialogue on the other side of the poster, which I haven't looked at in eons. Yeah. Uh, and the three LPs were from the Get Back sessions, and it was all packaged beautifully as the black album, but it was off the Niagara tapes. I had no idea what Nagra tapes were when I guess I was probably 17 when I got it. So songs would start and it'd be like, that's great. And then this irritating beep would come and that would be the end of the track. And it would pick up halfway through the long and winding road and beep you through a third way. So, but in this day and age, I would imagine that all there's healthy chunks of that stuff that could be salvaged and put out quite a lot. You know, there, there were albums on, there were three volumes of um, a bootleg called Sweet Apple Tracks. E each volume was a double record set. And, and that has some really 
good, interesting, funny stuff. Um, so I'm just hoping that that stuff's going to be in the Peter Jackson film because uh, I would have put it on the box set, but it could be that they don't want duplication and Peter Jackson's going to show that stuff. And, uh, and, and seeing it is probably better than just listening to a CD of it. That's why, you know, Peter Jackson has said he's going to have the whole rooftop concert. So that will be there. And um, whether or not they put out a soundtrack album uh, is, is sort of beside the point because you can rip the disc and burn your own CDs if you want to, if, if you really have to have it on CD. Um, I kind of think that, uh, you know, CDs are a little bit archaic. I mean, I hope that um, Apple slash Universal continues doing these for the other Beatles albums because the, the productions are really nice. They come with great books. It's, you know, all that. Um, but I haven't, you know, I haven't burned a CD in ages. You know, if uh, if if I were going to put together a playlist of stuff that isn't available on a CD, like the complete rooftop, um, I probably would just do it on my computer, just leave it there, you know. But that's just me. Listen to Joe well, Techie over here. <laughs> <laughs> I still burn CDs. Mm myself but um there's only so much we can debate this when we don't know what's about to unfold mm -hmm. and um you know there's a never-ending debate where the nagra stuff is concerned uh that the beatles if they care about sound quality if that's a main concern of theirs and there's probably a lot you could do to improve the sound quality they only want to put out the best product that they can and they have every right to feel that way but then we don't know what's going to happen with the Peter Jackson film, as we said, and if there's going to be a soundtrack and uh, right. who knows, really. And um, the Nagras, the Nagras really do sound good. I mean, it's not like those are, you know, handheld recordings with an open mic. They, they, it, mm -hmm. they, they really are good recordings. It's just um, they're mono, but the Beatles have said that they like mono better. So mm -hmm. there you go, you know. <laughs> and with... What we have today with technology, it's hard for me to believe that they can't do something maybe to turn it into stereo somehow. They can. Yeah. They can. People who you know, people that, sitting at their desktop yeah. have already done it. And as we talked about here, there's some Beatles recordings like uh, you know, the the Deca tapes that they've done that to. Right. And I think they did it to uh She Loves You because the and stereo to... master was was ruined or destroyed. Yeah, they've done it to all the Hamburg tapes, too. And uh, and mm -hmm. I have to say, I've, I've heard the stereo version of the Nagras. And actually, there are a lot of things that are clarified, even though it's not real stereo. It's just the four stem thing, um, you know, and it doesn't have artifacts, which is one of the problems with doing this kind of thing. They've, they've done a really good job. And um you know, when, when, when we were working on the, on the McCartney book, there were certain things where we wanted some dialogue of what was going on there. And I listened to the original Nagras and, you know, you can hear it, but um, it was actually a lot clearer on the fake stereo one that came <laughs> out. So, uh, you know, I think, I, I think they did a good job and they weren't Abbey Road. They're just some guy with a computer. So some guy who is Abbey Road, Giles, could probably do, you know, something spectacular with them, one would think. Mm. And also, well, you know what, since they, they've got all these, uh, you know, the, the okay, you, you don't get a new version of, get back single mix because I think, first of all, we had it on the one album, um, but also it's on the Glyn Johns album in the form it is in the single with the, you know, come reprise at the end and everything. So they probably thought no point in, in redoing that. Um, they did remix, let it be. Uh, and don't let me down the single versions when we don't get, you know, my name, look up the number. And okay, that's really a more or less 1967 recording, but it was a B-side of Let It Be. So it kind of belongs in the set. And it would have been great to hear that in 5.1 too. So, um, you know, all that you're getting on the 5.1 is the remix of the album, the Let It Be album. Um, right. 
and that too, I think some of these other remix tracks really should have been on the, uh, the 5.1 disc as well. And it should have included, you know, my name, look up the number in surround. <laughs> and also well, the a stereo remix of the fly on the wall disc from uh, Let It Be Naked. No, we need that. <laughs> okay. There's also the, the issue of, and this is my own personal feelings here with the Nagra stuff. Even if the sound quality remained terrible, if you're putting out a, a box set, chances are the same people who have been buying these bootlegs all these years will be willing to spend the money for something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So Absolutely. you're not alienating anybody by putting that stuff out. Yeah. But maybe it'll be in the Jackson thing. I mean, that, that's what I'm holding out for, you know, that it will be in the film, you know, certain of these um, really interesting Twickenham performances, you know, I mean, Susie's parlor, uh, they're, they're sort of weird little version of Obla D Obla Da, the third man theme, like mm -hmm. a lot of those things, you know, they're, they are having fun and it, they're doing them in a, in a kind of amusing way. I'm sure it would be better to see them than, than to just hear them. So I'm hoping that Peter Jackson will have used them. And if not, there's okay. still time to recut. <laughs> Yeah. And then, then there's the question of when we see it on Disney, how long will it take before the DVD and Blu-ray comes out? Right. It'd be nice if it was out for Christmas, but there's no guarantee of that. Mm -hmm. They'll anyway. release the EP, though, separately as a picture disc for Christmas. <laughs> Don't give them any ideas. Colored there. vinyl EP. Yeah, for <laughs> <the> record <laughs> store day in November. <laughs> All right, uh, more news here. On September 10th, that's this week, we'll be getting a limited edition special white vinyl release for John Lennon's Imagine. Following the incredible box set that came out in 2018, this will be a double vinyl release with the remix of the album from Paul Hicks and an album of outtakes similar to the double vinyl version that came out at the time of the box set. Only difference is this is in white vinyl. For the collector, who must have everything, like Alan. <laughs> Interesting interview with Rick Rubin in Ultimate Guitar discussing how the McCartney 321 series came about. Rick is quoted as saying, if you would make a list of the 10 best bass players in the world, many people wouldn't put Paul on the list. He belongs on number one, but you don't think of him as a bass player because he's a Beatle, and the Beatles transcend music in some ways. Who does Rick Rubin hang out with? <laughs> what a weird quote. I don't know, but no, well, you know, a lot of people are so overwhelmed by the Beatles and their presence and the music is great that very often you don't hear how great they are as musicians. It's not just Paul. I do feel that way. All right. You don't you don't sense the same thing? Well, McCartney, I've never sensed that. I've always thought that McCartney usually gets his due um, when talking about great Bass, it's maybe it comes down to you know John Entwistle versus McCartney or Chris Squire or who's better or who's number mm. one. But uh, I've always seen McCartney in in the in the conversation. Yeah, so okay. I usually see him in a list of a top ten, but hardly ever do I ever hear anyone give him number one status, unless it's a you know very big Beatle fan and a big McCartney fan. Um, he said, I called Paul and said, I have an idea, a documentary about you as a bass player, you as a musician. We don't really talk about that. We talk about the songwriting. We talk about Beatlemania, but we don't talk about the bass playing. And he said, sounds good. Let's do it. And that's basically how it happened. Just some quotes from Rick Rubin in that article. <laughs> a brand new limited edition issue has just come out for Super Deluxe Edition magazine on Paul's Press to Play album. Only 1,000 copies were made, all of which were signed by editor Paul Sinclair. And the first 500 are signed by Hugh Padgham, who co-produced the album with Paul. It includes an interview with Padgham, stories behind all the songs, plus others recorded during the sessions that weren't included in the album, like Spies Like Us and Hand Glide. Other news, George Harrison's archival release for All Things Must Pass, which re-entered Billboard's top 200 album charts at number seven last week, drops all the way down to 189 
this week. Just means everybody who wanted it bought it all at once. Here come the colored vinyl. <laughs> According to one of my most reliable news sources, that being Darren DeVivo, a never before published cassette tape with an interview with John and Yoko from their famous winter stay in Thai, Northern Jutland, from January 5th, 1970, will soon be up for auction at Brune Rasmussen Auctioneers in Copenhagen. The 33-minute long recording includes a conversation between the famous couple and four 16-year-old schoolboys who were allowed to interview Lennon and Ono, and at one point, the never-published song, Radio Peace, is also played. The cassette tape has an estimated price of 200000 to 300000 in Danish krone. Don't know what that translates to uh, American dollars. Four 16-year-old Danish schoolboys were allowed to interview the couple for the local uh, school magazine. And now more than 50 years later, they've chosen to put the cassette tape with the conversation and the never released song radio piece uh, for auction. The cassette tape is accompanied by a series of photographs taken by one of the four schoolboys with John and Yoko relaxing on a sofa, wearing wool socks and their feet resting on a table with Yoko's daughter, Kyoko, present. The Lennons were in Denmark to talk to Yoko's previous husband, Tony Cox, over the custody of their daughter, Kyoko. And the auction will take place on September the 28th. Okay, Peter Asher resumes touring September 16th for five dates in New York and New England. To see the list of dates, check out the upcoming concerts and events page on my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. The George Harrison Festival, formerly known as Harry Fest, that I reported on taking place on October 9th in Westport, Massachusetts, has been canceled due to COVID, and they're hoping to reschedule it for early next year. We're going to close with, believe it or not, five passings to talk about, three of which happen to be drummers. Of course, there's Charlie Watts, the legendary drummer of the Rolling Stones, the steady beat behind the band, uh, this great band for all their classic recordings and tributes were pouring in from Ringo and Paul and so many other people. You guys want to say anything about Charlie? Uh, Darren? Um, they are different type drummers, but I always kind of thought Ringo and Charlie Watts were, you know, I hear I said they're different drummers and I'm going to say they're cut from the same cloth. Same type of drummer in that uh, the less is more approach. The rhythm, the rhythm and the beat were more important than the show that, say, somebody like Keith Moon might give you. Uh -huh. um, I've always enjoyed watching Charlie play. Um, uh, whenever, you know, there's a concert footage, I'm always looking for Charlie uh, just in, in his style, being a wannabe musician myself, you know, um, and uh, always had a great drum sound. Um, I don't know what more could be said. He was, uh, he was truly a, a rock legend, music legend, uh, more ways than one. Um, and it was a shock to hear uh, that he uh, passed. Yeah, Alan? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Darren basically said the essential things. Uh, I think he and Ringo are, are, are like the two most underrated drummers in rock. Um, they're, they're both really exceptional drummers if you listen to what they're doing closely. And, uh, but they weren't, you know, showboats. Um, so, you know, that, that's not to, uh, not to uh, deny the incredible talents of Keith Moon and John Bonham and, and other drummers, oh, no, yeah, no. Um, but, you know, who were showy, uh, but, you know, it, it's just a different kind of thing. And uh, I also sort of always enjoyed Charlie Watts's jazz things. You know, yeah. he had side projects because he was a jazz drummer before he joined the Stones and, and that was his love. Um, so, yeah. I don't have it here with me. It's upstairs. I should have uh, figured that we would talk about. Uh, but I was unaware uh, that uh, that Charlie Watts and Jim Keltner did an album together as uh, the Charlie Watts Jim Keltner Project mm -hmm. and uh, picked up a copy on eBay 
Uh, but it's, I haven't listened to all of it. I sampled a little bit of it. It's kind of interesting because it's not a jazz record. It is and it isn't. It's also like electronic, uh, you know, beats and synthesized stuff. It seems pretty interesting, but uh, that was one that slipped past me. I never knew that there was the uh, Charlie Watts, Jim Keltner project, and they did uh-huh. one. In. I wasn't even aware of that. Yeah. Of that album. Yeah, because I went looking because I have a few of Charlie's jazz albums, which luckily I got, um, you know, back in the 90s when I was working at FUV and uh, was um, there's one called um, A Tribute to Charlie Parker with Strings, which is an outstanding album. That was oh, the first yeah. one that I ever heard that I owned. And that that was like, wow, Charlie Watts is this. I don't think I was aware at the time that he was this much of a a jazz head and uh, uh, he must have really enjoyed the uh, waiting on a friend sessions when they brought Sonny Rollins, Sonny Rollins in to play saxophone um, uh, on tattoo you. So, wow. I really can't add more than what you guys have said, but I've always enjoyed all the the classic Rolling Stone stuff. And I think sometimes drummers like Charlie or Ringo are are so taken for granted Mm because people concentrate on the front men. Like you said, the showmen and the people behind the scenes, the people that provide the steady beat, but also accent songs where it's needed with really yeah. interesting fills. Oh, yeah. They, there are, they are taken for granted for the most part, and they help to really make the song the special recordings that they are. It's part of the whole package. But uh, very sad to hear about that. Um, we also note the passing of another drummer, Ron Bushy from the band Iron Butterfly. Bushy's primal drumming would go on to influence many of his peers. An article from last year in Rolling Stone included an interview with Bushy where he said that Ringo and Paul came to see uh, the band at Royal Albert Hall and Ringo uh, took him out for dinner and drinks and said to him, I hope you don't mind I stole a part of your drum solo from Inagata De Vida for the Abbey Road track, The End. I told him, not at all. I took it as a compliment coming from you. I have heard that that at times. It has been said every now and then that Ringo borrowed from Inagata De Vida. I'd really have to go and pay attention to the whole song again. But, you know, for that one moment when Ringo gave a drum solo, it's so entirely his. And you think that way, but maybe we should go back and listen to. I think I can hear where I... I can't hear where Ron Bushy and where Ringo exact if there is, you know, but the type of drumming, the type of solo, hmm. um, the main difference is one is three and a half hours long and the <laughs> other is, uh, is, is 45 seconds or whatever. A lot less than that, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's, it's under 20 seconds, right? I, I think. I don't know how to count. So what do you want? Um, the third drummer I must mention was the original drummer for The Circle, Marty Freed, who died on September the 1st. The band toured with the Beatles on their 1966 U.S. tour, and they were known for the hits Red Rubber Ball and Turn Down Day. And the group was managed by Brian Epstein. In recent years, the group reformed with original member Don Daneman. Okay, so three drummers right there. Um, we're noting their passing. Also, music legend Lee Scratch Perry died at the age of 85 on August the 29th. He's known for being an architect of reggae and dub, having produced such acts as Bob Marley and the Wailers, The Clash, and the Beastie Boys. But he also played a part in the lives of the McCartneys. In 1977, he cut Linda's recordings for Mr. Sandman and Sugar Time at Perry's Kingston studio called Black Ark. Both recordings are on the Linda McCartney compilation White Prairie. And when Paul was busted in Japan for possession of marijuana in January of 1980, Perry sent a letter to Tokyo's Minister of Justice to voice his support for Paul. And finally, the Greek composer and lyricist, Mikis Theodorakis, (laughs) <laughs> Alan smiling there. I hope I pronounced it right, by the way. He has died as well. He scored for the film Zorba the Greek and Serpico and wrote the Honeymoon Song, which the Beatles performed live and recorded for BBC Radio. And Paul McCartney remembered the song and felt that it would be appropriate for his 
new artist for Apple Records, Mary Hopkin, to sing. And Paul produced her version on her first album for Apple, Postcard. Mikis was 96. And you said Serpico? Yeah. Serpico and Zorba the Greek. I think I'm trying to remember now, being a big Al Pacino fan, though, I think it was Serpico that um, I'm trying to pull up here. I mean, it's not important. <laughs> I don't want to waste time <laughs> on this, but uh, the soundtrack album, actually, I think it was, oh, my thinking, Serpico was just a reissued uh, for Record Store Day um, on vinyl, the soundtrack album. Um, I hope I'm not getting it mixed up with another uh, movie from that, you know, from the Pacino was in. But um, if people care, look it up. I may be wrong. This okay. is sad. More indications that as I get older, this isn't working anymore. Um, you know. See, but we're all in the same boat, so it's not as noticeable when it's. And, I, and I bought it because, <laughs> again, as a Pacino nut, yeah. uh, I figured uh, the, the reissue of the Serpico soundtrack. I got to have it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not out in 10 different colored vinyl editions. It was one came out on record store day, but uh, now it's going to bother me. So I'm going to look it up here while we talk amongst ourselves. Okay. I have an update on the uh, Danish Krona situation. <laughs> okay. Um, 200,000 Danish Krona is $31,859 and 68 cents. And for our British friends, it's 23,110 pounds and 41 pence. Um, for our Canadian friends, it is $40,292 and 46 cents. I can give you rupees, yen, um, just write in and I'll, I'll, okay. I'll answer. <laughs> but that's the $200,000, which I believe was the low estimate uh, on that tape. So right. you can multiply accordingly. <laughs> mm. Wonderful the services we provide on this show. Yeah, yeah, really. And I hear Danish and I think of Maury and Goodfellas because he wants to bring some Danish home for his wife. And then he gets right. the screwdriver. Anyway, uh, I was right. It is <laughs> the Serpico okay. soundtrack um, uh, did come out on vinyl, I think, last year, 2020. Yeah, last year. Uh, so there you go. If you want to go shopping for your uh, Me Mikis Theodorakis. The collection. Yeah. So that's Serp. I was right about Serpico coming out on record store day last year. Anyway, hey, this is a Beatles show. Yeah. So um, is that it for the news? <laughs> <laughs> that is it. Okay. We so cover on everything here. <laughs> on to our topic. Um, so um, what we just <laughs> decided to do, since there are so many albums with closing tracks to choose from, um, is to each choose three Beatles discs and five solo tracks from all of them mixed up. Um, and since five is so skimpy, given the size of the solo discography, we reserve the right to have honorable mentions as well. So um, how should we start this? Um, it was Darren's idea. Let's start with yeah, that. I guess. Yeah, it was something I thought of a couple of months ago and the song that the McCartney song that always, um, I don't know, the one that spurred the idea was Through Our Love from um, Pipes of Peace. Um, I tend to be, as a McCartney fan, a bit of a critic of the, of the sappy ballads and sappier uh, moments in McCartney's repertoire. And you could make the argument that Through Our Love could fall into that category, but I always thought that was a bang out, brilliant ballad and produced well by George Martin and uh, always just really struck me coming at the end of Press to Play um, and made me think, and I said Press to Play, me Pipes no. of Peace. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> and it got me to thinking about the songs that end albums that, that leave a mark on you, um, whether it be um, putting an exclamation point on the album whether it be a curveball that has maybe it just doesn't fit with the album and that makes it something special. Um, uh, whether it's a song that actually adds so much as the end of an album that 
it actually makes the whole record rise, the whole album rise. Um, and it could be anything and you could terp- interpret it any way. And before we started doing the show, we were debating, uh, would something like Her Majesty qualify? It's a song, but it was like an afterthought when they were putting Abbey Road together. Um, would that qualify? Would something like, I don't know, like, sp- something like Spooky Weirdness on Ringo's Rotogravure? Right, that's Rotogravure. Yes. Um, you know, or something right down the middle, like maybe A Day in the Life. Um, a, a song though that comes at the end of an album that leaves you with like a punch in the gut uh, in a good way um, that uh, kind of is this memorable finale to an album and it doesn't have to be Abbey Road stature it could be like Pipes of Peace one of the lesser albums uh, and a song that really uh, carries the record out like I think Pipes of Peace is one of Paul's weaker albums I mean, every artist has weaker albums and best albums. I'm not here to bash Pipes of Peace. But uh, something about Through Our Love, I think, really just takes the album and, and, and raises it up a couple of notches uh, in my book. And McCartney was very good at those dramatic, powerful um, finales that you remember. Um, so what I did when I made my list because we plan very thoroughly and then we all go in our opposite directions and do what we want anyway. And I sometimes, I always forget everything. Uh, so I actually did pick 10 songs from the solo years because there's so many albums. Mm-hmm. Uh, McCartney alone, uh, Ringo's 20 studio albums. Uh, and then you add John and George's catalog. You can't like cut it down to three and go through all of the solo albums, just come up with three great finales. Uh, the Beatles, it's easier because it's a much smaller body of work. Sure. So I thought three, um, and the Beatles have a few obvious ones that I have a feeling are going to be uh, a common denominator for us when we go through ours. So um, I didn't, uh, you want me to go through my, my picks? Why don't yeah. we just start with, with the Beatles or do you want to do the solo first? Well, however you want to do it, who goes first? Yeah. Um, me? I'll, yeah. I'll do the, my Beatle picks first. Yeah. So I picked three and I have one that I kind of put on the side as a, as a possible, um, you know, honorable mention, because, you know, I, I tend to think of the earlier albums as being more a collection of songs than in a cohesive album. Uh, and then starting with Rubber Soul and, and definitely a little more Revolver and obviously Sgt. Pepper, the album is the entity, the way the album starts and begins has a great effect. Not so much the case with with Beatles for Sale or Dizzy Miss Lizzy wrapping up the UK Help album. So the honorable honorable mention that I put in here was Twist and Shout from Please Please Me. Um, because if, if there was a, 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 an early collection of tracks of the Beatles music, Twist and Shout is one of the best ways to just put the exclamation point on on the whole thing but my main three big dramatic can't miss can't forget memorable album closers number one a day in the life and i don't not even going to explain why speaks for itself number two her majesty Hmm. uh why because it catches so off guard and I remember one of the first times I ever heard the album when I was five years old, and it caught me off guard, Her Majesty. And that little clever mistake is an iconic mistake. You know, a little songlet that was, you know, sitting there in the middle of uh, all of these medleys that were getting built together gets cut out and Paul says, throw it away. But they don't. And uh, a, an engineer taxing onto the end of the master tape. And you now have one of the most legendary, maybe for the exception of John Cage's, what is it? Two minutes, 33 <laughs> seconds. For the exception I mean, maybe of that, well, the new, new, well, how much is it? 433. Right. Uh, and maybe for the exception of the Newtopian International Anthem, that's a bit of silence there between the end and Her Majesty. Uh, <laughs> you're waiting. Why is my automatic 
remember when I was a kid, my dad had the automatic turntable. Why is the needle not coming up? Mm-hmm. What's the <laughs> boom? And for that reason, I think Her Majesty is just, it was an accident and arguably one of the greatest accidents in recorded music, <laughs> having that at the end. My third one is Tomorrow Never Knows. Okay. Um, for very similar reasons as A Day in the Life from Revolver. So those are my three Beatle picks with okay. Twist and Shout. Ken? Okay. Well, my picks are just about identical with yours, Darren. Um, I felt that as an honorable mention, you had to mention Twist and Shout. It was the perfect way to end that album. Mm-hmm. And also, I have to admit, you really shouldn't have history mixed with the recording and your your overall feeling of listening to the music, but knowing that the Beatles recorded 10 songs in one day for the Please Please Me album, and that was the last one when John was giving it all that he had left. He didn't have much of a voice, and that's what he came up with for his vocals, and it's this iconic rocker now, and it's, uh, you know, it became a hit all over again in the 80s with Ferris Bueller's Day Off and all that. It's become this very classic, and there's so many classics I know, but a classic rocker that whenever you think about early Beatles and classic rockers, Twist and Shout, as well as I saw her standing there, opening and closing the same album, uh, you couldn't have asked for a better way yeah. to bookend an album than than that, whether it was intentional or not, but it was it was really, you know, an ideal choice to end. Please, please me. Um, the top three, you have to say a day in the life. That's probably it could be the greatest album closer of all time for many artists. Mm-hmm. And what a perfect way to end that song. And with the tremendous orchestral buildup and that long E chord at the end going on for what was it? 40 plus seconds. Um, it gives you chills. You know, it's it's the. You couldn't have picked a better song to end that album. Um, Tomorrow Never Knows I Had to Put In There because it was so groundbreaking for its time and I think much more appreciated now, but it really signaled what was to come with Sgt. Pepper. And it's kind of ironic in a way because Tomorrow Never Knows is the first song they worked on from Revolver. They didn't lead themselves up to Tomorrow Never Knows. They started with Tomorrow Never Knows. And... um, yeah, for all the weirdness that's in that track and all the interesting sounds that came out of it, I had to put that in there. Um, when it comes to Abbey Road, you know, I, I understand your point of view about Her Majesty and that it catches you off guard. And I love all that. I love the aspect of it. We can debate whether or not certain songs are real songs or complete songs. But if you didn't count Her Majesty, I'd have to say Golden Slumbers carried that weight in the end. The whole, okay. the medleys on site two are so masterful. And uh, as time goes on, I marvel at the fact that they did the medleys and that the songs, with the exception of Golden Slumbers and Carry That Weight, were not conceived this way. <laughs> All these songs were strung together, but they were recorded two songs at a time, which I found to be really interesting. Um, and somehow it all made sense and it all flowed. That whole side two of of Abbey Road is a wonderment and it becomes more so through time. But um, when you think about the fact that it kind of was like, you know, it's the end of the Beatles. The song's called The End. It's like an epitaph in a way. Did they know when they were recording the song that it would be, you know, Mm -hmm. the last song on the album? And, you know, people can get very sentimental when they hear the words of Golden Slumbers. Um, and then thinking about the, the end of the Beatles and the breakup. Um, it's just a, a wonderful, you tie all that together with the musicality of all of it, and it can't be beat. Mm-hmm. So those would be my top three with Twist and Shout as an honorable mention. Hmm. I don't think it will surprise anyone. <laughs> <Am I laughs> you the same? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my three were Tomorrow Never Knows. I mean, you take them chronologically um, just because it really is an extraordinary track uh, that that sums up Revolver perfectly. Uh, and as, as Ken says, you know, was the first track they recorded. So how they were summing it up, who knows? But, uh, you know, it's it's it. 
it has that electronic experimentation and it um, and it really sort of pointed to, you know, where they were and where they were going. Um, we didn't know that at the time where they were going, but it, it you know, revolver sort of flows into pepper in a, a pretty natural way. Um, a day in the life, or is the, the, pretty much the reasons Ken said, you know, the orchestral buildup, the long chord. I mean, it is an incredible album ender. Um, and it might be the best album ender of all time, except for, for I think, the final medley of Abbey Road. That might actually surpass it. Um, oh. You know, there you have in the, the final track on the final Beatles album, with the exception of Her Majesty, which I'm going to um, think of as having an asterisk, although, you know, Darren's reasoning is, is great. Um, the Beatles did a lot of that afterwards, you know, on their solo albums, there were lots of little tracks at the ends of things. And uh, I think, um, I think I tended to look more at the big full blown final tracks. Um, but, you know, with the end, you've got everyone playing a solo, you've got, um, you know, the, that the final final bit at the end, you know, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make, you know, is as good a motto for the entire Beatles era as you can find. Um, so yeah, that to me is like, is probably the perfect closer, maybe even better than a day in the life. And I also had twist and shout as an honorable mention, but I had a second honorable mention um, from one of the American albums, meet the Beatles, not a second okay. time. Um, I, I just, you know, love the way that closes it because it's, you know, it, it I still kind of can remember that song fading out and, you know, and that being it. And, you know, it's a good song that is otherwise sort of buried in the middle of with the Beatles um, and uh, putting it at the end of meet the Beatles, I, I think actually um probably was accidental, but I thought it worked really well. So those are my Beatles ones. I always say you remember your first, um, but in terms of music, I mean, Not a Second Time was one of your first album finales and for That's the Beatles right. it was your first and it left its mark. Yep. If you did it today, it wouldn't move. It wouldn't move you, I'm sure. And uh, I, I, Meet the Beatles wasn't the first Beatles album I heard. It was one of them. Uh, I think my cousin gave me his copy in the very late 60s. Again, when I was uh, amassing these records, I was like four or five years old. And it was like, not a second time left. Uh, I still can picture it, listening to it on my little beat up record player. I could still picture and uh, hear the scratches, the surface noise as it faded out. So... Yeah. yeah, and you were, and you were you undoubtedly sitting there saying, I just love those Aeolian cadences because that's the song. <laughs> that's the song well, of yeah. the Aeolian cadences. No, because mom made Aeolian cadences with uh, steak on Saturday nights, and I, oh. I was never fa I, I was I never liked those. Mm. Never mind. Okay. Uh, okay. But anyway. Just like Alan, my first Beatles album was Meet the Beatles. And I've always thought of Not a Second Time as an album closer. Yeah. Even when I started getting used to the UK albums, that's money doesn't end this album. Come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like the, these songs develop a character all their own when, when they are the last song on an album. You they know, really another one. Yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ken. No, 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 that's fine. Uh, another song along those lines for me that I didn't pick and I didn't even actually, no, maybe I did run for your life. Some reason that at the end of rubber soul, the American rubber soul, when I got that, that I remember getting as a Christmas gift around the time I was nine or 10. I mean, it's a, you, it's a great song. It's not the Beatles best. It's far from being the best album closer, but early on, I heard it was one of my learning experiences and run for your life. I'll always picture it's the end of the UK version, too, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yeah. Yep. It, it was another one of um, John's things where, you know, you can see his inspiration because the seams are still showing, you know, um, like come together with, uh, you know, Chuck Berry's You Can't Catch Me. And he still has 
the bit of the line in there and, and uh, run for your life was from uh, Elvis's baby. Let's play house. I'd rather see a dead little girl than to be with another man. Um, Mm -hmm. A sentiment that in today's world, you, you, I don't know that anybody would record that song, but. uh, Which is a shame in a way. I mean, there's this, you know, being politically correct and and everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Uh, People didn't take it as seriously back then. And nowadays, whenever, you know, Paul or Ringo say all our songs are about peace and love. Well, you know, Maxwell Silver <laughs> Hammer was not <laughs> right. You know, and run for your life. life. I mean, you know, so you can you can point out songs like those, and and nobody thought much about it. You know, please, in those days. Please send your emails to Ken Michaels. <laughs> oh. Not me, not Alan. It was Ken right. who said it. Brought it up. See where I'm sitting. Ken is over. Oh, is it? See, yeah. then I'm asked to do this thing. So you <laughs> say. You know, so there, not a second time as well. There was it was sort of almost like this subliminal thing where it's you know not a second time, not a second, and you're thinking, no, I'm I'm definitely playing this album a second time, and you just turn it over <laughs> and do it again, you know. So I don't know. There was something about it. There's something about it that that, that really worked. Um, Maybe given the, the, the fact that, that you guys chose the same main things as I did, I should have made that a main one instead, but. Um, so mm. should we go around and do the solo ones starting yeah. again with Darren? Yeah. I thought, Alan, you were going to pick good night. Hmm. But anyway, I would, so have, I would if I were going to do that, I, I would have said that um, good night doesn't count in the way that her majesty doesn't. And that the white album really should have closed with revolution number nine. <laughs> <laughs> so I and, didn't count. The, I didn't break down. I have my 10 songs here. Solo stuff. Uh, and it is a little bit McCartney heavy. And I think McCartney had more of these songs that I would qualify as epic, classic album closers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will also admit that I only picked one Ringo. Not I love Ringo, but he didn't tend to have that, that, that exclamation point at the end of many of his albums. He yeah. did give us... Um, uh, you know, those a couple in a couple of instances, those like those bookend closers. Um, Lennon did the same thing with the rock and roll album, which just because almost like he's rolling out the credits at the end of the song. Mm-hmm. So in no particular order, and I intentionally jumbled it around. So it jumps around. I mentioned at the top of uh, of the top of the topic through our love from Pipes of Peace. Okay. Uh, and I already spoke a bit about that. So that's one of my 10. Uh, Next one from Living in the Material World, That Is All, which I think sums up, drop my pencil, sums up Living in the Material World very well. Very simple, very spiritual, um, just gorgeous, beautifully produced song that is, wouldn't probably work on another album, but on Living in the Material World just compliments everything that you had heard before. Um, so that that is all from George Harrison. Yoko gets a nod for Hard Times uh, Are Over on Double Fantasy. Hmm. And uh, yeah, I remember when I heard Double Fantasy for the first time, John had already been murdered when I got it for Christmas that year, 1980. Uh, it really, really hurt hearing Hard Times Are Over. And I, I still to this day think to myself, if they only knew, you know, when she wrote it, when they recorded it, sure. perfect album closer for an album like Double Fantasy and what should have been um, this uh, this great positive sentiment as we look forward to Milk and Honey and whatever was going to come, the tour or whatever, whatever that all that stuff that never was. But Hard Times Are Over from Yoko, wrapping up Double Fantasy, uh, is my third one. Here's the one that's going to raise a few eyebrows. Uh, I just, from when I was 12 years old, loved this song to this day. Uh, one of Paul's off-the-wall tunes, More Smooths and the Grey Goose, <laughs> putting a rap on London Town. Mm-hmm. Um, one of Paul's better rockers, uh, great vocal. Don't know what the heck they're singing about. And I think that's what really made it appeal to me uh, at the end of um, at the end of London town. 
Um, so that's my fourth song. Number five, another Wings one, Baby's Request. From Back to the Egg. Baby's Request is another one of those songs that made me think of this topic. Because mm-hmm. after all that went down on Back to the Egg, you know, heavy, m- more electric rocking stuff than Paul packed onto an album uh, than ever before, comes this, like, end of the night, hanging out at the bar, relaxing jazz tune. Perfectly executed, Lawrence Juber's guitar playing, yep. um, Steve Holly playing brushes, uh, Baby's Request, uh, and, and then ultimately really being the finale of the Final Wings album. Uh, that was a subtle yet brilliant McCartney tune that more people should know. Uh, and I think, uh, did very well there as the finale, the back to the egg. If you believe from George Harrison, self-titled album should have been a massive hit. I don't Mm. know how it wasn't a massive hit, uh, and was a fantastic closer to the album, positive energy, uh, perfect marriage of lyrics and melody. Again, it should have been a hit. I don't, I don't get what went wrong there. But I guess that was also at the time when, you know, people were paying a little less and less to George's music. They missed out on a big one and a good one there with If You Believe. From Ringo, You and Me, Babe, I had because I wanted to include Ringo in this. And I think that's the best album closer, in my opinion, that Ringo's done. Uh, a song co-written with Mal Evans. Uh, but just, you know what, like like um, Baby's Request, You and Me, Babe, might not have worked on another album. But on Ringo, a good-natured album like Ringo, it was an ideal finale. Uh, positive, good-natured, uh, wrap it up, flip the record over, let's listen to it again type of song. Um, Warm and Beautiful from Wings at the Speed of Sound was another one of those that I was thinking of when I thought of the topic. Simply a McCartney ballad, a love song classic that nobody knows except us. Hmm. The hardcore Beatles slash McCartney slash Wings fans. Warm and beautiful. This is another curveball. My ninth pick, uh, Meat City from Mind Games. I love Meat City. I have no idea what it's about. I don't think it's about anything. It's off the wall. Mm-hmm. It's a great song to put into the end of an album. Yep. Um, Side two of Mind Games sort of begins to flow a bit of the, on the mellow side. Uh, and then here comes Lennon rocking, and he rocked better than most. And Lennon's humor was nuttier than most. And then at the end of my list is the 10 minute four song medley that adorns the end of Red Rose Speedway. Mm-hmm. Um, there were simple songs there. In some instances, you could say, hold me tight. Lazy Dynamite, Hands of Love, and Power Cut individually are throwaway songs. But, you know, McCartney was such a brilliant writer that he heard these four songs that maybe he couldn't figure out what he wanted to do with them or how he wanted to present them. He heard them, put them together in a medley, medley, in a medley, and uh, it fantastic. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, and my my uh, the one that fell off because we I kept it to ten was the back seat of my car from Ram. So that's my uh, those are my uh, big album closers. Hmm. Well, I shouldn't follow you, Darren, because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of repeats there. Um, first of all, thank you for what you said about if you believe. Many is the yeah. time I've said on the radio it should have been a single. He said a few yeah. of those, Harrison. I don't yeah, know. Don't how let me wait too early. long. Beautiful Girl oh, wasn't yeah. released as a single. True Love could have been, even if it wasn't a big hit, a modest hit. Um, his version of True Love. Uh-huh. Um, Teardrops. Uh, yeah, Teardrops was a single. Yeah, but it didn't. You know. I know. And True Love, I think, was a single in the UK, I think. I'd have to double check on that. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, and but I, I don't think those songs from Red Rose Speedway in the medley were throwaways. I think they could have been on their own separate, really strong songs. Okay. That's part of the genius of Paul is stringing yeah. these songs together and somehow it all flows. Yeah. And the, the thing that, that most of all I love about that medley is at the very end when all the songs are brought together simultaneously and it's, it's beautiful. 
it all works you know okay so um my endings um let me just bring up something that that you were mentioning earlier in the show when it came to album closers there are certain songs where they're very short and you don't really know for sure if you want to count them as real songs um in the case of uh, i want to put god in there as an album closer because it's such a powerful song especially everything that john is saying in the song and striking down idols mm -hmm. and uh, i just believe in me yoko and me and that's reality and the dream is over is such an iconic line now but then there'll be some people who will say my mummy's dead is the last song on the album so it's it's debatable and the beautiful thing about that you can make more of a case for my mummy's dead because it bookends the album you got mother at the start you got my mummy's dead at the end so yeah. it has more of a purpose there so um but if you didn't count my mummy's dead you have to put god in there yeah. it's just too much of an important song in john's career placed right there at the very end of side two of plastic Ono band and just the whole arrangement of that song and the piano playing on it and billy preston playing on it and ringo's drumming on it oh my god it's you know it's such a masterful song. I had to include God. Um, my first three album closers are the ones that I felt I didn't even have to think about. Whereas all the other ones, I'd go through the albums and I, I said, I'd say, that makes a really good album closer. Um, but the second one on my list has got to be 1985. I mean, what better way to end Band on the Run and to bring back the chorus of Band on the oh, Run yeah. at the very end of it. You know, it's uh, it's another song that has this tremendous buildup and you've got the Tony Visconti orchestration uh, there at the very end of the song and everything of how the, the piano is pumping very much like, you know, Lady Madonna style. And the melody is just so wonderful. And it, it is a perfect song for Paul. And I'm so glad that he he brought it into his set list. Uh, I think it's one of the best songs of his solo career, and he's made so many of them. But um, that's a good pick. More, more, more than anything, it, it works as an album closer. Um, you know, kind of like, and McCartney will do this every now and then. He'll take the title track to an album. You know, um, like uh, "Tug of War" was made into a "Tug of Peace" towards the end of "Pipes of Peace." Or Sgt. Pepper bringing that back at the end of the Beatles album. It's the same thing here with 1985 bringing back Band on the Run. And then Picasso's last words before that had other songs from Band on the Run mixed in with it as well. Um, and then I had to put You and Me, Babe, in there. I mean, if there was ever a song meant to close an album, that's it because you can picture the song being sung in a nightclub. I think yeah. you said that, Darren. Yeah. And then here he is thanking everybody who was involved with the record. And um, it's like he's saying, good night, everybody. I'm on my way out. Mm. You know, I'm leaving the stage. And it has that whole vibe to it. Um, yeah, you have to pick you and me, babe. The other um, honorable mentions, thank you for saying that is all. That is all to me is one of the greatest love songs George Harrison has ever written in his entire career. And I have said many times that I even think it's of the status of something. It's that great a song to me. Beautiful melody, beautiful words executed there. Very simple words, but very effective. That is all I want to say. Our love could save the day. The very fact of the nature that, that it's called that is all. <laughs> and it's the end of the album. Um, it works right there. I love a really powerful love song ending an album. And that's what you got with um, That Is All. I also think Hear Me, Lord works, not counting Apple Jam. I think that it's, you know, it's got uh, the spiritual quality and the production of Phil Spector and George. And that, that feeling of like you're in a, you know, a cathedral or a church or something. And for some reason, maybe it's because I'm so used to it being the last song. You know, I think of it as an album closer through our love. Thank you for saying that, Darren. Um, it is one of the best of Paul's love songs in his entire career. I feel I love the whole production from George 
George Martin. Some think it might be a little overproduced, but I think it works at the end. And the message of, you know, we can do things that they said were impossible. We can see things that they said were invisible, on and on and on like that. The very positive message of the song. And also, and I, I have to mention this because I do this occasionally, but um, when, I, when I got married to my wife, Joanne, we had four wedding songs, one from each Beatle, and the yeah. one from Paul that we picked was Through Our, our Love. Um, I had to put, again, another case of does the last song really count? Um, Nobody Loves You When You're Down and Out is a great album closer. Um, but to have Yaya at the very end, you know, a few seconds of that with Julian on drums, I don't really consider that, you know, a serious recording right there. Um, so I had to put that in there. And that's an amazing song to itself. The words in that song are fantastic. Very depressing, but it works for so how many uh, what are John you was trying to, to do right there. <laughs> this is seven. Know? Well, you had 10, right, Darren? I just went with 10 straight. Darren, yeah. Darren, who I, 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 should, I should mention to the listeners that Darren was the one who came up with the idea of doing five. <laughs> Actually, no. Ten. That was Ken? But you're right. Someone said five. and then it. Well, you have f- uh, five honorable mentions. Five plus five is yeah. 10. Yeah. Alan? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just mention the other three without going into detail about it. I thought Backseat of My Car is one of the great um, closers. I love Only Our Hearts from Kisses on the Bottom, another great love song from Paul, which is very much overlooked. My Valentine got all the attention, but Only Our Hearts, I think, is it really deserves to be a standard. Good one. And I also like what goes around from Time Takes Time. I think that really worked as... uh, as a song to end the album, very strong song, melodically, great hooks in it, a lot of build up in it. I think that was an ideal choice to end Time Takes Time. So those are my 10. But the ones that were absolutes were God, 1985, and You and Me, Babe. All right. Okay, so let's see. Um, For me, uh, backseat of my car is, uh, you know, an incredible album closer. I'm, I'm, I'm almost amazed that it was just um, a, a runner up for both of you. And I don't, I, can, I don't know if it was in Ken's five or in the 10, but. Um, it's an honorable mention. It's an honorable um, mention. So yeah. more so than 1985. I automatically yeah. think of. Yeah. Um, the, so. Both of them are, 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 are great. Uh, album enders. I like um, Backseat of My Car as a song better than 1985, although, uh, you know, 1985 has a lot going for it. Uh, uh, but it, it wasn't one of mine. And, and you, it, well, it was sort of like it's on the list, but it wasn't one of the top five that I picked, um, only because I wanted to, you know, get, uh, you know, some George and Ringo. And, um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, 1985. I mean, there's also a, another element of it that, that um, didn't get mentioned, so I might as well, is that sort of uh, choral section right in the middle of it. It, yeah. it. it breaks and stops and does that and then back into yeah. the piano riff. Um, it's, it's, it's an incredible structure and you can read much more detail about it if our book ever comes out. <laughs> um, uh, but so backseat in my car is like, you know, to me, it's like a little uh, pocket opera, you know, and there is so much going on. It's three songs joined together. They all work together. It, it uh, alludes to the, that sort of Beach Boy sound that Paul likes so much. And I do, too. Uh, a lot of us do. And, um, you know, uh, outside Brian Wilson, I think Paul does the best Beach Boys music. <laughs> um but uh, anyway, yeah, that's uh, that was an incredible way to close the album. And as a sort of honorable mention, another track from those sessions, Little Lamb Dragonfly, also one of my favorites from that bunch of, of songs recorded during the Ram sessions, was the closer on at least one version of the two LP set of Red Rose Speedway. So um, so I, I, I figure I can get away with giving that an honorable mention on that <laughs> basis. Um, so then, um, sticking with McCartney and and I'm not doing it any, you know, the order of my top five, they're just, you know, uh, 
when winter comes on McCartney three, um, oh. that's a great closer. Yeah. yeah. You know? And, uh, and I wanted something, you know, having gone with backseat in my car, I wanted something more recent as well. And that, you know, it does a lot of the things that we've been talking about with some of these other tracks, you know, Ken mentioned pepper in the reprise and, and 1985 and band on the run. This does it in a, in a, in a sort of different way. It, it starts with, it has the guitar riff from the opening track of the album. And then it's a, a, a completely different song. Um, and, an, and I love the imagery of it, that sort of barnyard imagery, you know, it's, it's just sort of a nice laid back countryish song. And I think for all the stuff going on McCartney three, it just sort of wraps it up in a nice homey way. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just like the song a lot. So, um, Let's see. Um, I went for John. I went with God. Um, I know, you know, all the reasons that my mommy's dad actually ends the album and reprises, you know, the mother thing and, and all that, but God, you know, for the re reasons Ken gave, I, I have to agree with that. Um, and it's just an incredible song. It's, it's one of those songs that, uh, you know, you get chills listening to now since John's death, um, even this far away. Um, but the dream is over became, you know, at that time that that became sort of a, a major uh, motif of, right. uh, you know, the the news coverage and everything that was going on right after he was shot. Um, but, you know, at the time it's, uh, you know, he's really, he's really largely talking about the Beatles, although he's talking about all kinds of things in that list of his, mm -hmm. um, but mainly I don't believe in Beatles was, you know, to a lot of us at the time, kind of like, well, okay, we know you feel that way, but, but we do, <laughs> you know, um, but it was, you know, it was courageous to have, uh, have it out like that. Um, and as another honor, an honorable mention from John, um, O Yoko from Imagine. Um, I thought of Hard Times Are Over, um, but I suspected um, because of some of our emails going back and forth that Darren might pick it. And I turned out to be right there. <laughs> so I went with O Yoko because it's, you know, it's, it's a nice, cheerful, uh, you know, upbeat song. It was where John was at the time. I mean, you know, he knew that a lot of people really didn't want him singing love songs to Yoko and he was going to do it anyway and, and the, and the album with it. Um, however, and, however, yeah. Capitol records wanted that to be a single and John refused. Yeah. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. Cause they saw the commercial potential in it, mm -hmm. you know, and I certainly would think of it as a possible hit. But John chose not to go that route. I don't know. You know, mm. only Imagine was a single, at least in the U.S. Okay. Um, for Ringo, I went with A Man Like Me from um, Bad Boy. Hmm. Really yeah. like the song. Um, it has a... Uh, I associate it really more with the Ringo TV show. The one with, you know... Hmm. Carrie Fisher and I want to say Ed Norton, but it's <laughs> Art Carney. Art Carney. Um, and uh, John Ritter. Uh, yep. That's yeah. right. Angie Dickinson. Angie Dickinson. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, but it, uh, it, I, I associated with that show, but it also is the closer of that album, which was, I guess, his current album at the time that that show went on. And it's a, you know, it's a nice laid back, gentle song. And, uh, it it just it just closes that album nicely. Not one of his greatest albums, although I think it's better than people give it credit for. Um, but but that's a good song. Um, for George, I've got two, so one of them has to be an honorable mention, I guess. Um, okay, let's go with "Save the World" um, from somewhere in England. Um, it's particularly a powerful song right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a, that's a song that has, uh, you know, passed the test of time. And, uh, you know, it's also in that, it's in that George almost Cracker Box Palace style of semi-humorous, but serious. You know, the music is almost humorous. 
but the lyrics are serious. And it's like he had that combination in an unusual way. You know, he could be both funny and serious at the same time. Save the World is one of those. Um, there is an alternate mix of it on a Greenpeace album. Um, Greenpeace is mentioned in the song. Um, so uh, I went with that. But my other George choice would have been, well, I, I had two other choices. <laughs> Hear Me, Lord, which the two of you mentioned. So um, I probably don't have to, but it, it, you know, it really sums up all things must pass really well uh, in a way, although it, it in a way gets overlooked, I think, a lot. You know, you think of My Sweet Lord, you think of All Things Must Pass, you think of Wawa. Hear Me, Lord is just sort of stuck there at the end, but it's actually a very profound song. Uh, and my other one would have been Got My Mind Set on You. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it's not an original, um, but nevertheless, it was the hit from that album and it closes it, it closes it really well, really upbeat with, again, that George Harrison sense of humor. So those are my, uh, actually, I probably came up with 11. <laughs> I actually was strongly considering got my mind set on you. Um, I, something about it, it went for every artist that I've liked. Uh, I just, I don't know, something about a hit single being the final song on an album. Yeah. I, just, I, did, you know. I, I was thinking about that with Got My Mind Set On You and also with Ebony and Ivory, which is a song that I love a lot. But you think about all the great material that's on Tug of War. And I, and I love Ebony and Ivory, don't get me wrong. I love the combination of Paul and Stevie Wonder. But I think it's a drop down a little bit, you know, although I love the message, too of Ebony and Ivory. And sometimes I have a problem with placing a hit at the very end of the album. It should be like very early on, maybe to open an album or the second cut, but the last cut, I don't know. Well, Although think of look the, at Twist and Shout. <laughs> or the Beatles' second album ending with She Loves You. Hmm. Yeah. Chicago had uh, um, um, uh, old days at the end of Chicago 8 and uh, um, feeling stronger every day at the end of Chicago six. I mean, I thought that those were very clever. I mean, I don't know. They didn't, I don't recall if they were singles before the albums came out hits, but you know, I just something about uh, singles at the end of albums hits at the end of albums. I always kind of like, that. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Well, there's our uh, favorite album closers with some changes. If we did the show again in a year, I'm Absolutely. sure, you know, a couple of things, uh, you know, that were mentioned that I thought, hmm, OK, or maybe I shouldn't be so hung up on in the case of all things must pass. I too, looked at the album too literally like, no. Nope. Apple Jam ends the album. <laughs> or uh, uh, disc. Yellow Submarine and Pepperland. No one picked that one there. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so there you go. There they are. Right. So we should um, go around, give our contact information. Um, do you want to start, Ken? Yeah, you can reach me at my email address directly at everylittlething at att.net. I also just want to mention, I do this once in a while here on the show. On my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, there is a page devoted to my radio show called Every Little Thing, which just in case there's anyone that hasn't heard the show, is a syndicated show that's heard on, it's now 50 radio stations I have it up to. And um, uh, on one page on my website, you can find all the radio stations that run it and when they run it with links to their websites to stream it. It's not a show that you can download. It's not on demand. They're all live broadcasts from each radio station. But you will hear the widest variety of Beatle music and solo Beatle music on that show with interesting themes like album closers, which I have no doubt, you know, I'll be doing on the show. I probably have done it already. I've done so many different themes. But um, yeah, check out my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. I have a YouTube channel now called Ken Michaels Radio, and I have some new shows that just were posted. Dylan Seavey, who has been a guest on the Two Legs, Paul McCartney, solo Paul McCartney podcast. He's a drummer, multi-instrumentalist, uh, who lives in Nashville, and he did a number nine dream show on Ringo, where he picked his top three Ringo drumming songs in the Beatles, 
top three Ringo drumming songs in his solo career and top three Ringo all-star band lineups. So uh, that was a very interesting show. And um, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff that's on uh, my YouTube channel now. So please check that out and subscribe to it. My, um, my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The next show airs next Monday, which is September the 13th. And we'll be reviewing Stop and Smell the Roses because this year marks the 40th anniversary of that album from Ringo. We have a Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, where it first appears. And you have to like that page and watch the show, which is Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And then after that, it's on every platform imaginable. And it's also on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe to that as well. Um, and uh, there you go. <laughs> I think that's everything. All right. Okay, Darren. Yeah, you can send me an email if you'd like at WFUV. My email address there is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. D A R R E N D E V I V O. Uh, go to Facebook, uh, where I'm always uh, hanging around. And uh, I've got two pages. Darren DeVivo, send me a friend request, or go to the other page and click follow. Uh, the other one is Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, and Beatles Podcaster, I believe is the name of it. Either one of them, and then I'll invite you to the other page. And um, also, if you'd like to, uh, and I'd love if you'd listen, if you want to hear me on WFUV, 90.7 FM in the New York City area. Uh, two other ways to listen if you're outside of the metropolitan New York metropolitan area. You can stream WFUV at WFUV.org or download our app and you can listen there. I'm on the air Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. till uh, midnight, Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4 in the afternoon uh, on WFUV. So that's the my, that's my thing. By okay. the way, Darren, yes, happy sir. anniversary. Yeah, it's not it's not really an anniversary in a way. It's just because <clears throat> I started at FUV and, and this was back in the day when WFUV was a college radio station. It was Fordham University's college station, uh, but we, it was a big college station that covered the entire tri tri-state area. And uh, in September, as a freshman at Fordham, um, 1983, I walked through the doors for the first time. I remember being very timid and rather nervous and could very easily have chickened out and not gone through with it, but uh, went in, started my training, uh, worked at WFUV as a student while I was an undergrad at Fordham University in the 80s, having no idea uh, that my career path was going to be right there because as I finished up at school, WFUV was transitioning into what it is today, uh, which is a public station, a non-com, um, uh, with students on staff, but not a co college station. So that's that's a mm. story for another day. But it was 38 years ago, right around now, that I strolled through the doors for the first time and saw the on-air studios and was very intimidated. <laughs> but it's great to just to say you've been at the same radio station for that long a period of time is pretty amazing. And, and <laughs> you can't find that <laughs> in most yeah. radio stations sure. yeah. in this country. Yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing. Okay. Much lighter so, and had much more hair then. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can contact me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen remixed. You can write to all of us, uh, by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Say it again because it's long. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. That's all one word. Uh, we have a Twitter feed uh, at, at things we said fab. Um, we have two Facebook pages as a group, things we said today, and things we said today, Beatles radio fans. And the shows always get posted there, also on Podbean, iTunes, YouTube. Um, if you haven't subscribed to us on one or more of those, it would be great if you did. Um, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, 
that's, I think, a wrap. And uh, for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Take care. Peace and love. Peace and love. <laughs>